was that masked man? That's for the old timers and the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Just a few announcements as we get started. Um, giving tree tags and money are due today and they can be placed in the giving boxes at the rear wall to help support the Naraya Health Care Center in where? Haiti. Haiti. Correct. Thank you. Um, nine families have taken bags of cards for shut-ins. It's important that they're brought back by next Sunday, on or before next Sunday, because next Sunday afternoon, those will start to be delivered to our shut-ins so that every shut-in has all those cards. It's important that they're back next Sunday morning. Also, we encourage you to bring a bag of food in for the town's food pantry. It's a tough time of year for a lot of folks, and that goes a long way if every family would just bring one bag in. Um, that can be placed in the cart in the lobby or even dropped off on Chestnut Street at the food pantry there. Christmas Eve theme is the light of the world. Service is at three and five. I don't know if you noticed our sign up on our update that went out this week. You can sign up online for which service you would attend, or there are forms in the back table in the lobby to sign up as well. It's important that we know what service people may be coming to so we can just make sure we're set up safely. And as soon as one is filled, and that is filled, and we have to have people go to the other service, so it's kind of first come, first serve as well. So be sure to sign up for one of those services if you plan on attending. Boxed offering envelopes are available for next year. And there's a lot of powerful reasons for this. One is as a reminder to us to support God's kingdom work, even if we're not here and we're away on vacation or something, it's a mailer can be sent in. It helps Judy, our collector, to be able to keep tabs on everyone's giving so she can provide an accurate end of year receipt for you for tax purposes. Um, and they're available in the lobby on the Welcome Center. If you don't have, see your name listed there and would like a box set, there's a sign up sheet. Just put your name there and we can get one to you. There's no slide for this, but our St. Pauli shed is back in business and that is the shed here on the side for clothing. Uh, people from the community bring bags of clothing in, and we actually get some income for that. So the clothing itself goes to needy families in the states and around the world, and a lot of it is shipped overseas, which is why we had to close that for a while. They weren't shipping clothing overseas. But secondly, the income we receive from that goes to help support mission emphases as well a lot of times. So it's a blessing in many different ways. We do need an individual to oversee that shed. And what that is is literally 10 or 15 minutes a week, it can be even after church when you're here, to go out, make sure things are bagged well, put the bags in the corner, and then they pick up about once a month. So if you're interested in that serving opportunity, please see me as soon as you can or give me a call this week. At this point, John and Sue are going to come and light our Advent candles. Good morning. Today we relight the first Advent candle, the candle of hope. We can have hope because God is faithful and he can be trusted to keep his promises. The second candle represents love. Advent is a time of year when we reflect on the love that God has for us, seen in Christ coming into this world for our forgiveness. In 1 John 4, 10 through 12, we are told, This is love, that we love God, but that we, he loved us and sent his son as an adorning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since our God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
David speaks of God's love in Psalm 57, 9 to 11. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Paul's prayer to Ethesians in chapter 3, 7 through 19, is also appropriate for each of us this Advent season. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Please stand if you're able. And this God who loves us so much, he's come here through his Holy Spirit to meet with you today. That never ceases to amaze me. That God himself is here through his Holy Spirit specifically to meet with you personally. And he meets with us very specifically as he inhabits our praises, as we worship him, he fellowships with us. He meets with us as we hear his word, he fellowships with us. So think about as we read this invitation to worship and uh, and say this prayer, and through the rest of our time together, through the songs even, God is here to meet with you personally. Join me as we pray our prayer. God, I've come today to lift my heart and voice to bless you, to meet with you, and to be blessed by you. Thank you for being here to meet with me. Our invitation to worship is from Isaiah 9, verse 2. It's a responsive reading. There are two readings that you will share um, with the word everyone. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The light that is the word of God, God incarnate. Let us worship as we wait for the newborn king. We don't have to wait any more because he's come. So come and adore him. Christ our King. In prayer. Lord, that is indeed who you are. You are the way maker when there doesn't seem to be a way out of our situation or a way for us to receive wisdom and strength we need. You provide a way because you are the way and the truth and the life. You're the miracle worker, just coming into this world as a human being, going to the cross eventually to secure our forgiveness and salvation. So many miracles. You are a miraculous God. You are promise keeper. You always fulfill your promises, God, always, because it's impossible for you not to because of who you are in your nature and character. And you are light in the midst of our darkness. Is there an area in your life right now, personally, extended family, whatever it might be, where you need God to move, to fulfill a promise, to do a miracle, to shed light on a situation? Just lift that to the Lord now, whatever it might be.
Lord, we acknowledge our desperate need for you every day. And this day, God, pour out your spirit upon us. Give us our daily bread, mind, body, and spirit. Just strengthen us. We pray especially for Fran and Sandy's son-in-law, Bob, with leukemia, that his body would more readily receive chemotherapy, that there would be a bone marrow transplant donor available. Just bring good out of that situation, God. We thank you for our Learning Center grade school and church ministries, that you would protect each one, keep our staff, parents, children, attendees healthy. Give us common sense, God, in the way we try to be safe as well. And give our teachers and administrators the physical, emotional, and spiritual strength they need that, to serve the children you've entrusted to us. And as always, God, we continue to pray for that vaccine, that it would be made available quickly, distributed well and quickly. And as we relate to others this Christmas season, Lord, sensitize us to your spirit. Who might be going through a tough time in some darkness and needs your light? Who needs to understand your love for them that we sang about? Just give us a sensitivity as to whom you might want us to, to plant seeds of that love in their lives this Christmas season when they might be more open to spiritual truth. That we might be your light in the midst of this dark world that we live in. Bless us now as we hear your word. Speak to us through it and help us to follow it. And we ask all these things for your honor and glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may remove your mask if you desire. Well, the next few weeks we're going to take a break from our series on Peter and share some Advent Christmas messages. Christmas is big business in the United States. I'm sure in many other countries, but in particular the United States. Last year, holiday retail sales surpassed the $1 trillion mark. Now our mind can't comprehend how much money that is. But one trillion dollars is actually one million piles of one million dollars. Puts it in a different perspective, doesn't it? One million piles of, of one million dollars. And part of me says, it's Jesus' birthday. What if we, every person, Christian and non-Christian, would give what we spend on Christmas to a ministry that serves the poor around the world? What kind of dent would one million piles of one million dollars make in feeding the poor of this world. Pretty huge dent, wouldn't it? They say the average U.S. household spent about $1,500 last year for Christmas. So have you ever really wondered why do we give gifts to one another at Christmas? It's Jesus' birthday. Why do we give gifts to each other? 
Some may give gifts because of tradition. We've always given Christmas gifts and we give them without really thinking about why. Even many non-Christians give Christmas gifts. And it's interesting because the word Christ is very prevalent even in the name of that holiday, that holy day, right? C-H-R-I-S-T, M-A-S. So let's make it a little more personal. Why do you give Christmas gifts? to others. The giving of gifts may have started for two reasons. One may be because the wise men gave gifts to Jesus. A second reason may be that our gifts to one another are a symbol of the great gift of salvation that God has offered to humanity in his death and resurrection. So we give gifts to others as a symbol of, of God's great gift to us. Today we're going to look at the significance of the gifts the wise men gave to Jesus and what kind of gifts might we give him. It's likely that just as the wise men were led to Jesus by the star, they were also led in what gifts to give Jesus. Roman numeral one in your outline, the wise men's gifts to Jesus, what were they? And what do they say about who this child is? Matthew writes in chapter two, one to 12, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Now, he was already disturbed. He was just more disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Prophet Micah in the Old Testament. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Liar, liar, toga on fire. <laughs> After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, I'm going to get off on that. Not the stable, but a house. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The first gift mentioned given to Jesus was letter A, the gift of gold. Why would gold be brought to Jesus as a gift? One reason could be the wise men were being used by God to provide much needed funds when they were going to flee to Egypt. Joseph was warned in a dream not to take Mary and the child he was warned in a dream to take them to Egypt because Herod was going to try to kill them. Gold was the most precious metal known at that time, and Mary and Joseph were very poor, so it would provide the much-needed funds for them 
to travel to Egypt as well as housing when they arrived there. But along with this practical use of gold, gold was also, number two, a symbol of royalty, acknowledging Christ as king. his authority to rule. In verse two, the wise men asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Also, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, informing her that she would give birth to the Messiah, he said, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus came to the earth to set up God's spiritual kingdom where he would rule and reign as king. It's where he would be reverenced, respected, and worshipped as one's personal Lord and King and God, as well as be the head and the authority of his church. As the wise men presented their gifts to Jesus and worshiped him, we're then told in verse 12, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Becoming a Christian is not only acknowledging our need for Jesus as our savior, it is also submitting to him as our Lord, as our King. This is not to earn our salvation. It's not to keep our salvation. It's a loving response to this great gift of forgiveness and salvation and heaven to come, relationship with God now, and on and on and on are surrendering to Jesus as our Lord, as our King, is part of our salvation. One cannot separate Jesus as Savior from Jesus as Lord. They, they go together, Lord and Savior. So honoring Christ as our Lord not only involves worshiping with him our lips, it's also worshiping him by striving to live our lives, surrender to him, seeking his will and his purposes for us on a daily basis. Not going back to our own country, to our own society, but going back another route, another route. Living lives, submitting to Christ. So one of the gifts given to the Christ child was gold. To meet practical needs of finances, but also as a symbol of Christ as our King, as our Lord. Second gift mentioned in verse 11 is the gift of incense. Why was this gift given to Jesus? There were many uses for incense in biblical times. For instance, number one, it was made into perfumes. In a hot land that was short on water, such as Israel, perfumes actually took the place of deodorant. Took the place of a bath even, with limited water. William Coleman, in his book, Today's Handbook of Bible Times and Customs, says, before going out or hosting company, a lady might oil her skin and then stand by the incense burner. The rising scents would permeate her hair, clothes, and skin. Some women hid a small bag of perfume beneath their clothing. Sounds like they were walking potpourri bags, doesn't it? By the time of Christ, 
Incense was also used as an air freshener, as well as to keep flies, fleas, and mosquitoes out of the house, almost like a citronella candle. So we can see the practical use of incense for Jesus as a perfume baby oil, as well as to maybe fumigate, because Jesus had messes too. They didn't have Febreze back then. But there's a religious use of incense as well. Once a year in the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter that veiled Holy of Holies area of the temple where God's presence dwelt. He would carry a cursor of burning incense with him. So that gift of incense was also a symbol, number two. It was a symbol of Jesus being our high priest. Leviticus 16, 12 and 13 says of Aaron the high priest, he is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He's to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so that he will not die. The smoke from the incense acted as a covering between the high priest and God's holy presence. If we were to look upon the full glory of God, he would die. That's why on Mount Sinai, God said to Moses, you better go in the cliff and just kind of catch my back as I pass by because you cannot live in the holiness of my presence in your fallen humanity. You will die. That's why we need God's righteousness given to us as a gift of grace in order to be in heaven, in order to be in God's holy presence. We're not there in any righteousness we might have, but clothed in his righteousness. They would actually tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest to pull him out in case he would look upon God's full presence and die. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 speaks of Jesus as our high priest. Such a high priest meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Jesus, our high priest, the sacrifice he's made, he made for us was his own self in his death. Jesus is our high priest in that like the incense of his sacrifice, like his shed blood, if you will, has provided a covering and atonement, forgiveness for our sins that we might be made right with God in this life and be with him forever in heaven. He came into this world, was born in a stable, lived a holy life, and 33 years later, nailed to a wooden cross to take upon himself the condemnation of our sin against him so that we can be reconciled with God in this life and forever. Our high priest alone has made that possible through his sacrifice for us. So we have seen that gold symbolizes Christ as our king. The gift of incense symbolizing him as our high priest. And thirdly, letter C is the gift of myrrh. Myrrh is a gum-like substance that is extracted from a small tree. It was not only used in perfumes like incense, 
Number one, it was used in embalming and symbolizes death. John 19, 39 and 40 tells us myrrh was used in the burial of Christ as well. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. According to Jewish custom, they would use this myrrh and aloe mixture in wrapping the linen strips around the body, much like the old movies you used to see with mummies, much like a paper mache globe you may have made in elementary school. The gift of myrrh was symbolic of Jesus' death. But it also reminds us as followers of Christ that death has no power over us. It reminds us of Jesus' victory over death and our victory over the death in relationship with him. Paul shares with us in 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He says for the Christian, death has been abolished. Yeah, we still have to deal with it and go through it, but it's just a doorway into the eternity of God's presence, his love and joy and peace forever and ever and ever. But besides being used in embalming, myrrh was used to deaden pain. It was a type of anesthesia. While on the cross, the soldiers offered Jesus a mixture, a myrrh anesthesia to deaden his pain, but he refused it. We see this in Mark 15, 22 to 25. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see which, what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. Myrrh then is related to suffering, and therefore it's a symbol of Jesus as our suffering servant. Since he was to experience the suffering that all humanity deserves for our sins against God, he was not open to anything that would alleviate that physical, emotional, or spiritual pain. Isaiah shares about Christ, the Messiah being our suffering servant. Chapter 53, 4 to 6. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken, stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, meaning reconciliation with God, was placed upon him. And by his wounds were healed, were made whole in relationship with him. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But Jesus is not only the suffering servant. In Christ, he is our suffering servant. He knows what it's like to suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually. He can relate to us when we're going through tough times. 
He knows what it's like to suffer for righteousness sake, to follow God's will and be put down for it or ridiculed or persecuted for it. He knows what it's like to be misunderstood, to be ridiculed, to be made fun of. He knows what it's like to be without a home, to rely on others for food and clothing and shelter. He knows what it's like to deal with excruciating pain. Not again, not just physical, but emotional and spiritual as he hung on a cross in particular. As we're all aware, the Christian life is not free of struggles. God knows what you're going through. And he wants to walk with you in the pain and struggles that you're going through. As your very personal suffering servant, he understands what it's like. And he's with you and he's for you. These three gifts the wise men brought to Jesus have both practical uses as well as being very powerful symbols. Symbolizing Jesus as Lord, as King, symbolizing him as our high priest and our suffering servant. But the only way he can be our very personal high priest, our very personal suffering servant, our very personal king, is for us to know him as our Lord and Savior. For us to understand what he did for us personally on the cross and make a commitment to follow him as our Lord. Paul teaches us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What every human being has earned for our wrongdoing, the wages of our sin is the spiritual death of being separated from God in this life and for all eternity. That's the bad news. But the good news is that God loves each of us so much that he created us to be in relationship with him. And through the death and resurrection of Christ, he's done absolutely everything necessary to restore us to relationship with him, to give us meaning and hope and significance now, give us purpose in life now, as well as the confidence and guarantee of heaven to come. And he offers that all to us as a gift. But like any gift you might receive this Christmas, you might be offered this Christmas under the tree, what do we have to do? We have to open that gift, don't we? We have to receive it. And it's the same with Christ. We have to choose to believe he loves us. We have to choose to believe Jesus came into this world and died on the cross for me personally so that I can know God now, so that I can be in heaven when I die as a gift that can never be earned. The angel's proclamation to the shepherds is meant for each of us personally. 
I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in a town of David, a Savior has been born to you. If you would like to receive the gift of God's love and know that love personally, the gift of his forgiveness of everything you've ever done wrong or will do wrong, the gift of knowing him intimately now, the gift of heaven to come, then I encourage you to pray this prayer. Just pray this silently to the God whose spirit is here. Dear Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much that you died on the cross. For my complete and total forgiveness, forgive me for the things I've done wrong. I believe that everything necessary for me to know you personally in this life and to be with you in heaven in the next was already accomplished on the cross. I now receive you into my life as my Savior. And I surrender my life to you as my Lord and King. Amen. If you pray that from the heart, the Bible is clear that you have become one of God's children. That relationship with him is secure for all eternity. But once we have received Christ as our Lord and Savior, what kind of gifts should we give him? Roman numeral two, what are our gifts to Jesus as followers of Christ? If you could only give Jesus one gift, what would it be? Think about that. You think you have a spouse or friend who's tough to shop for? Tough to shop for, huh? What do you give to the God who owns everything? Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live on it, in it. God owns everything. What gift can you give to God that would bring joy to his heart? Part of the lyrics of the Christmas song in the bleak midwinter are, what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can I give him? Give him my heart. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all your mind. Biblically, the heart means the core of our being. The gift that God wants from us is the gift of ourselves the gift of our hearts, because everything in life, Scripture says, flows from our heart. What we say, what we do, it all, it doesn't really begin here. It begins in the heart. Or it may begin in the mind, but it actually is, is then processed through the heart. Here are a few other gifts that really sh we should be given to God after we give him our heart, and we're to give him that consistently. 
the gift of our love for him is a response to his love for us. The gift of our worship blesses God and brings joy to his heart. Another gift God loves to receive is our spending time reading his word so he can speak to us through it. So we can grow in relationship with him. When Nate and Tori ask, what can they get me for Christmas? I typically tell them, I don't need anything. Just get me something that enables us to spend time together with one another. Because the best gift you can give me is, is yourself, your time, fellowshipping with one another. And that's a gift we can give to God that blesses him tremendously. If you're a parent, how do you feel when your kids say or do something that shows you they want to spend time with you? That's God's heart for us. Our Heavenly Father loves it when we choose to spend time with him, worship, prayer, time in his word. Then there's the gift the offering of God of using our time and our talents, our abilities to serve him and others. Jesus tells us whatever we do for the least of these, we also do to him. In addition, it blesses God when we use the gift of our finances to support his kingdom work. and to bless others. Then there's also the, the gift of our obedience, of choosing to follow God's will for us day in and day out. All of these gifts would be, we should consistently be given to God as a lifestyle. And yet they all come from the heart. And they all reveal our heart. They're all fruits of a very intimate, personal relationship with God that, that should be manifested when our hearts are soft and pliable to God, when our hearts are surrendered to him. And our motivation for giving these gifts to God is our thankful appreciation for the great gift of forgiveness and salvation he has given us in Christ. It is the greatest gift anyone could ever offer. And it's the greatest gift anyone could ever, ever receive. complete and total forgiveness. No guilt, no condemnation. Intimacy with God now. Purpose now. Meaning now. And the icing on the cake, being in God's presence in heaven forever and ever and ever. If that doesn't stir our hearts, then we need to be praying for, to God for him to soften our heart. Because that needs to be the very core of our being as a Christian. a heart that loves God, a heart that seeks to honor him and serve him every day of our lives, to, to be with him. It 
May God soften our hearts. May we allow him to soften that heart. Let's pray. Lord, soften our hearts. It's so easy as Christians for that heart to become stagnant, for that heart to even become hardened. Soften our hearts, God. Soften them toward you. And that comes, God, as we really understand your love for us, as we really understand your gospel, your death and resurrection on our behalf, as we really understand All these things, God, is the only way our heart can be soft towards you. So during this Advent season, God, remind us afresh every day of just how much you love us by Christ coming into this world being placed in a wooden feeding trough and later sacrificed on a wooden cross. We offer you our hearts today, God, and ask that you would continue to mold them and make them, keep them soft towards you, that we might then honor you with how we choose to live and, and serve you and others. It's for your glory and honor we ask these things, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please On the stand. welcome table, if you don't have internet and haven't received our update, there's a sign-up sheet, even if you do, if you want to sign up for one of the Christmas Eve services. There's hard copies on the table as well. God bless. Have a good week.